Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Gamita Sales Conference Call for the first quarter 2020 results. My name is Chris, and I'll be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants' lines are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question at that time, please press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that this call is being recorded at Gamita Sales request. And if you require any further assistance, please press star zero. Now I would like to introduce your host for today's conference, Ms. Sharon Madden, Vice President of Investor Relations and Corporate Communications. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's call, where we'll provide an update on the company and review our financial results for the first quarter of 2020. Earlier this morning, we issued a press release summarizing our financial results and progress across the company, which is available on our website, www.gamita-cell.com. You can find the press release related to today's call. Here with me on our call today is Julian Adams, Chief Executive Officer, Ronit Simentoff, Chief Medical Officer, and Shai Lankry, Chief Financial Officer. Following our prepared remarks, we'll open the call for Q&A. During this call, we may make forward-looking statements about our future expectations and plans, including clinical development and commercial objectives, the therapeutic potential of our product candidates, our operational plans and strategies, and projected operating expenses and cash runway. Our actual results may differ materially from what we project today due to a number of important factors, including the considerations described in the risk factors section of our Form 20F and in other filings that the Muta Cell makes with the SEC from time to time. These forward-looking statements represent our views only as of today and we caution you that we may not update them in the future, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. And now, I'd like to turn the call over to Julian Adams. Thank you, Jaron, and thanks to everyone for joining us this morning. At Gamita Cell, we are committed to finding cures for patients with blood cancers and rare serious hematologic diseases through the development of next-generation cell therapies. Last week, we were thrilled to announce that the global randomized phase three study of omidubacel, our most advanced product candidate, met its primary endpoint with a high degree of statistical significance. We are also making strong progress with GDA-201, our investigational expanded natural killer, or NK cell therapy, with the potential for both hematologic malignancies and solid tumors. Additionally, we announced a $60 million follow-on earlier this week which is expected to close today. As we have experienced minimal impact due to COVID-19 today, so we have made significant progress so far this year as we advance our programs. Starting first with Omidubacel, last week we reported positive, highly, highly significant top-line data from our global randomized phase three clinical study of Omidubacel in patients with high-risk hematological malignancies in need of a bone marrow transplant. The data demonstrated that omidubacel resulted in a significant reduction in time to neutrophil engraftment, a key milestone in transplant recovery. These data exceeded our expectations and were very consistent with our results from our Phase 1-2 clinical study. These data underscore the potential for omidubacel to create a new standard of care, Based on the results of the Phase three study, we are confident that omidubacel could serve as a graft for any patient in need of a bone marrow transplant. By providing a, steadily, a readily available bone marrow transplant graft, we can reduce the time patients currently spend waiting for a donor match. We can also help relieve patients and their families of the anxiety they currently feel during the search process. Additionally, Omidubacel can make transplant accessible to the 40% of patients who today are eligible for transplant but unable to find a matched donor. With these data in hand, we are focused on working towards initiating a BLA submission on a rolling basis in the fourth quarter of this year, which will position us for a potential launch in the second half of 2021. We are also advancing key activities to bring Omidubacel to patients following potential FDA approval. Work is ongoing to build out our manufacturing infrastructure both at Lanza 
and at our own facility to help ensure sufficient and reliable commercial supply. We are also working to develop comprehensive hospital services and patient assistance programs designed to seamlessly bring omodubacel to patients. Moving now to GDA 201, we are continuing to advance phase one clinical study and are working hard to initiate a multi-center phase one, two study in patients with lymphoma next year. We have previously reported striking early signs of efficacy with multiple complete responses in patients with advanced lymphoma. We expect to present updated phase one data at a medical meeting in the second half of the year. We are quite fortunate that the impact of COVID-19 on our business has been minimal, and our hearts go out to all the families who have been affected by this tragic pandemic. At Gamita Cell, we have taken, undertaken important steps to help ensure safety of employees and their families and to reduce the spread of COVID-19. In early March, Gamita Cell established a work-from-home policy for all employees other than those performing or supporting business-critical laboratory experiments and manufacturing-related activities. For those employees, the company has implemented stringent safety measures designed to comply with applicable government guidelines institute in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we believe our guidance with respect to clinical development and regulatory milestones are unchanged. We will continue to closely monitor any possible impact from COVID-19 and will provide updates on any changes that occur. I'll now turn the call over to Ronit Sementov, our Chief Medical Officer, to provide a further update on Omidubicel and GDA-201. Ronit? Thank you, Julian, and good morning, everyone. As Julian noted, last week we reported positive top-line data from our Phase 3 study of Omidubicel. We are very proud of this rigorous, well-executed trial, and we truly appreciate the support of the transplant community, including the investigators and their teams, the patients and their families, who partnered with us to help move the field forward. This Phase 3 study was designed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of Omajuba cells compared to standard umbilical cord blood for allogeneic bone marrow transplant in patients with high-risk hematologic malignancies. Demographics and baseline characteristics were well balanced across the two study groups, and the primary endpoint results represented an intent-to-treat analysis of all 125 randomized patients. The primary endpoint was time to neutrophil engraftment, the key milestone in recovery from bone marrow transplant, signifying how quickly the stem cells the patient received became established and began to make healthy new cells. We strictly defined engraftment as achieving an absolute neutrophil count of greater than or equal to 500 cells per microliter on three consecutive measurements on different days with subsequent donor chimerism. Neutrophils are infection-fighting white blood cells, and chimerism is genetic evidence that the donor cells have engrafted. In the intent-to-treat analysis, the median time to neutrophil engraftment was 12 days in patients randomized to Omaduba cell compared to 22 days for patients in the comparator group randomized to standard core blood transplant. The p-value was less than 0.001. Importantly, this was a clinically significant difference because faster engraftment is associated with fewer infections and shorter hospitalizations, which is meaningful for patients, physicians, and the hospital. These data were consistent with our Phase 1-2 study, where we reported a median time to engraftment of 11.5 days for patients who were treated with Omaduba cell, compared to 21 days for a historical cohort of 146 patients treated with standard cord blood. These data also compared favorably to the time to neutrophil engraftment that has previously been reported in other studies for other transplant modalities, where we have seen data ranging from 16 to 21 days. We remain blinded to individual patient outcomes, and data on additional endpoints continues to be collected as they mature. Secondary endpoints include time to platelet engraftment, infections and hospitalizations, and additional endpoints include graft versus host disease, immune reconstitution, and survival. We expect to present the data at a medical meeting at the end of the year. 
We're also evaluating omidubicel in an investigator-sponsored phase 1-2 study in patients with severe aplastic anemia, a rare and life-threatening blood disorder. Oh. Last year, we completed the first cohort of this study, which showed that all three patients successfully underwent a bone marrow transplant consisting of omidubicel plus a haploidentical stem cell graft. Currently, patients are being enrolled into the second cohort, which is designed to evaluate omidubicel as a standalone graft. We expect to report additional data from the study in the second half of this year. In addition to omidubicel, we are also advancing our second cell therapy program, GDA-201, a natural killer-based therapy. The ongoing study in patients with non-Hodgkin lymphoma and multiple myeloma is designed to assess the safety of GDA-201 in combination with monoclonal antibodies and to determine the recommended phase 2 dose. We have already achieved our phase 1 objective, and as additional patients are enrolled, we continue to be very encouraged by the safety and activity observed. In February, an abstract was published in conjunction with the European Society for Blood and Marrow Transplantation, or EBMT, annual meeting, which was to take place in March, but was subsequently postponed due to COVID-19. These data included 11 patients with non-Hodgkin lymphoma and 14 patients with myeloma. I'll briefly review the data in lymphoma. Among the 11 patients with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, seven achieved a complete response, and one patient achieved a partial response. While this is a small data set from a single site, the activity observed in these heavily pretreated patients, including those with diffuse large cell lymphoma, compare favorably with responses observed in other studies, including early studies of CAR T therapy. We also continue to be impressed with the safety profile of GDA-201. In 25 patients, there were no dose-limiting toxicities and no GDHD, and importantly, no neurotoxicity observed. With the primary objectives of the study complete, we have an opportunity to evaluate the duration of response and to ask additional questions to inform future development plans. For example, we have successfully retreated patients with GDA-201 without lymphodepletion. In multiple myeloma, we are evaluating the addition of pomalidomide to the regimen, which may provide better activity than elotuzumab with GDA-201 alone. In summary, we are very excited about the potential of GDA-201. We expect to report additional data in the second half of 2020, and we are advancing the activities required to enable the initiation of a multi-center Phase 1 2 study in patients with lymphoma next year. With that, I will turn the call over to Shai to review our financial results. Thank you, Renate, and good morning, everyone. As Julian mentioned, we are pleased to close our $60 million follow on offering today, which importantly strains our one way into the second half of 2021. Now, I will review our 2020 first quarter financial results. As of March 31st, 2020, we had total cash, cash equivalent, and available for Social Security of $40.3 million, compared to $55.4 million as of December 31st, 2019. The $40.3 million excludes approximately $60 million gross proceeds from the following offering, which we expect to close today. Research and development expenses for the first quarter for $7.9 million compared to $7.3 million for the same period in 2019. The increase was primarily due to clinical activity related to the advancements of GDA-201 offset by grants received from the Israeli Innovation Authority. Commercial expenses were $1.5 million for the quarter compared to $1 million for the same period in 2019. The increase was mainly attributed to Army Dubisel commercial readiness activities. General and administrative expenses were $3 million for the quarter, compared to $2.8 million for the same period in 2019. The increase was mainly due to expenses associated with being a publicly traded company. Net finance income was $1.7 million for the quarter, compared to net finance expense of $4.4 million for the same period in 2019. The increase was primarily due to non-cash expenses resulting from revaluation of warrants. Net loss for the, for, for the first quarter was $10.6 million, compared to a net loss of $15.5 million for the same period in 2019. At the beginning of the year, we provided guidance for the first six months of 2020. Today, we are updating our guidance to reflect full year expectations. We expect cash yield for ongoing operating activity this year 
to range from 60 to 70 million dollars. We anticipate that our current total cash position will support our ongoing operating activities into the second half of 2021. This cash runway guidance is based on our current operational plan and excludes any additional funding that may be received or business development activities that may be undertaken. With that, I will turn the call back over to Julian. Thanks, Shai. 2020 has proven to be a transformation year for the uh, quarter for the company. The phase three data further de-risk Omidubicel and provide us with an opportunity, an important opportunity, to bring op- um, a potential cure to patients in need of a bone marrow transplant. We look forward to reporting the data from the phase three study including secondary endpoints in the second half of the year. At the same time, we are focused on critical activities, including filing our BLA and ensuring commercial readiness as we look for, toward the potential launch of Omidubicel in 2021. With GD8201, we have a highly active clinical development candidate in an area of science that is increasingly recognized as holding potential to further transform how certain cancers are treated. We have a strong team in place committed to delivering the next generation of cell therapies to patients and look forward to further updating you uh, on our progress. Now uh, we will open the call for questions. Operator? Thank you. And as a reminder to ask a question, we need to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question comes from the line of Gregory Renza with RBC Capital Markets. Your line is now open. Good morning. This is Ying Luan for Greg. Thank you for taking my questions and congrats on the progress. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could share some feedback on the top-line data now that it's released in terms of what could KOLs and investors be latching onto and also what are the pushbacks and how is this shaping your focus for the awareness and alignment that you need to build as you go forward with the regulatory and also to establish the value proposition, increase visibility in the market and therapeutic space. Thank you. Monique? Uh, sure. I will, um, I'll, I'll give you the impression that we have had from the transplant community, uh, the physicians and investigators who participated in the study, um, are very, very excited to see these data. They are, um, really, uh, really behind us in terms of developing Omidubacel and, uh, are very, very gratified to see that the result of the study were so convincing and so clinically meaningful for their patients. Uh, they uh, really see neutrophil and graftin as being critically important in the recovery of patients for transplant. And so they believe that um, we, uh, we really have uh, the opportunity to be disruptive to the transplant community. So we, having had the um, primary endpoint be complete and successful, we um, will um, and have had breakthrough therapy designation with um, the FDA. Until this time, we've discussed the uh, clinical development throughout uh, the program with FDA. We expect to take these data and um, submit them uh, in a BLA by the end of the year. And I will add to that, um, we're going to build out a uh, medical affairs and medical education uh, platform, uh, engage KOLs, uh, and really uh, broadly uh, educate uh, the transplant community um, as to the potential for omidubicel. Um And this will be done in conjunction with both the, the clinical department uh, uh, and uh, the commercial uh group uh, to prepare the market and uh, the commercial uh, group uh, to prepare the market for Omidubicel's launch, potential launch next year. Great. Thanks. That's very helpful. And maybe just on uh, another on the GDA 201 program, 
Um, how are you balancing the focus on that program? And is that an increasing focus now? And would it make sense to accelerate the program? And would that be a possibility? And how will we think about the strategy there? Thanks. So GBA 201 is a very exciting program for us. It's uh, based on the platform that brought us the Omaduba Cell program and uh, a lot of the experience, knowledge, and, and relationships that we've made are, are ones that we're leveraging uh, for development of GBA 201. Uh, we continue to develop that program with uh, development of a cryopreserved product in our laboratories, uh, and we will intend to bring that to a clinical study of company-sponsored multi-sensor study for patients um, next year. So that, that program is quite important to us on the heels of Omaduba Cell, and uh, we, we will continue to focus on that. Great. Thank you very much. Hi, Messer. With Needham & Company, your line is now open. Uh, great. Thanks. Good morning. And, you know, again, congrats on, on all, the, all the progress. Um, maybe a couple more on, on GDA 201. Uh, in terms of the data update in the, in the second half, um, just wondering if you can maybe set expectations in, in particular on um, whether we can expect to see more data on redosing. Absolutely. So we, we incorporated redosing into the protocol last year, at the end of last year, in order to give patients the opportunity to have a second dose. And that second dose is done without lymphal depletion, so that gives us a lot of experience on eliminating lymphal depletion from the patient regimens. And so additional data that will be presented by the end of the year will include uh, a, a multiple dosing in patients, uh, including um, including uh, the lack of or the, the elimination of the lymphal depletion for those doses. All right. That's very exciting. Um, and maybe just expand a little bit on a, on, on a prior question. Do you think there's a fast-to-market strategy in NHL? Um, and then, you know, any further thoughts, and we've talked about this in the past, on other indications besides uh, NHL and multiple myeloma? Absolutely. So in, in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, in both patients with large cell disease as well as silicon lymphoma, we've seen very impressive responses, including a high percentage of complete responses. And we really feel that this is a, a population where patients have been treated with multiple therapies, have been refractory to standard of care, and there's a need for further therapies in these patients. It's making a real clinical difference in the patients who've been treated on this study. And so we do feel that there is a, a potential fast-to-market strategy with response rates at the level that we've already observed them in our Phase one study. Uh, we believe that, um, that a, a, a study that will be designed to look at response rates in a population of patients like this one uh, could potentially lead to uh, a, a stra a, a, an approval uh, in this patient population. So absolutely. In terms of other um, indications, so we believe that the non the, that the, the natural killer cell program is really a platform that can be used in conjunction with monoclonal antibodies to generate uh, ADCC antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, potentially for other tumors. And so we in the laboratory have generated some data using other antibodies, including in solid tumors. And we hope to be able to bring that to patients at some point in the future to explore the capabilities in other tumors. All right, great. And, you know, obviously excited for, for Omni Dubacel, but um, looking forward to hearing more about uh, this program as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you need to press star one on your touchstone telephone. And to remove your question, please press the pound key. And our next question comes from the line of Jason Butler with JMP Securities. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. Uh, I had two. Just the, the first on, uh, Julian, your comments about getting the, the medical affairs effort um, out and discussing the Amadouba cell data. Can you just talk to where you are in that process from, from a, you know, a medical affairs leadership perspective or when you think you'll be able to be out there talking about the, the, the top line data versus, you know, later in the year having the, 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 the secondary endpoints. And then on 201, can you just talk about the progress you've made towards 
um, getting a, a, a manufacturing process um, applicable to a multi-site center uh, study, and, and, and if you're working or plan to work with a, a manufacturing partner uh, at some point on that program also. Thanks. Yeah, so we're actively uh, uh, recruiting for medical affairs uh, talent, um, and uh, our, you know, rap, we, we depend. Uh, it was dependent on the successful financing, so that we would have the wherewithal to uh, continue to build out uh, all of the infrastructure, both for medical affairs, commercial, uh, and manufacturing. So um, this triggers our ability to go out and. Uh, these data trigger our ability to go out and for, begin a real education process. Um, and to your second question on manufacturing, uh, we are undertaking to manufacture uh, uh, the NK uh, GDA201 product uh, in our own facilities. And um, um, the, the key uh, event is, is to, now that we've uh, learned how to cryopreserve, uh, and recover NK cell activity uh, is to turn that into a GMP process. So there's still uh, some process development going on, uh, but we're quite confident that we will achieve our model. Great. Uh, very helpful. Thanks, and congrats on, on all the progress and the, and the phase three results last week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This does conclude today's question and answer session. I will now let you turn the call back to Julian Adams for any further remarks. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on today's call. We are excited about the opportunities that lie ahead and look forward to sharing updates on our progress throughout the year. Chris? Thank you. This concludes today's call. You may now disconnect.